God had made Israel wander in the wilderness for 40 years. We're going to tell you a little bit about the story as we of Israel in the wilderness. We have one story, the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. We're not sure where it took place, whether it was at the beginning of the 40 years, the middle of the 40 years, or the end of the 40 years. But it's the next story given in the book of Numbers. And in this, exam in this story, we have Korah leading a rebellion to the leadership of Moses. And... Uh, in this rebellion, God is going to open up the earth and a number of the leaders of this rebellion are going to be swallowed up. They just simply will fall straight down into the earth and the earth will close over the top of them. Fire will then come down from heaven. It will consume 250 more people. And the people will then murmur and complain that Moses killed them. And a plague breaks out. And about 15,000 more will die in the plague, just under 15,000. Then God says to show who he has chosen, he has each tribe bring in a rod. Now, what we're talking about is a walking stick. Probably smooth, fine, um, whatever kind of a stick they used might be used in hurting the animals, but they, they bring that, that rod in that's used by shepherds and used for walking, and uh, it's set there overnight, and the next day, Aaron's rod, it has budded, bloomed, and is bearing almonds. Apparently, it was a rod from an almond tree, and so God has identified that I have chosen the house of Aaron to be the priesthood and Moses as our leader. At the end of the 40 years, God is going to have Moses then lead them on into the land of Canaan. Now, interestingly, Israel has spent the 40 years in the wilderness just south of the land of Israel. And uh, they have wandered around from place to place out in that vicinity. God has been feeding them manna. God has been providing them water. Uh, but there they are. And instead, now God wants them to march clear around to the other side, the eastern side of the land of Israel, around the Dead Sea, and come in to where they have to cross the Jordan River. Now, that is not the logical way to get into the land of Canaan. The logical way was to go straight north, not march initially south, clear to go around the land of Edom, around the land of Moab, and then to the Jordan River. But I can also tell you this. Sometimes we don't understand the leadership of God. Uh, in seeking holiness or going into the land of Canaan. Sometimes we don't understand what it takes to get there. But I do know one thing. We need to find out what God wants us to do and follow the leadership of God and simply obey God. Israel is going to ask permission to go through the land of Edom. Edom refuses permission. Rather than fighting against Edom, they will march south, clear around the land of Eden, down to the corner of the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aquaba, that part of the Red Sea, and then swing around the land of Edom. They will likewise swing around the land of Moab. And uh, while they're marching, uh, they run out of water, and the people complain. Moses is outraged. God tells Moses to speak to the rock and he'll provide water. Moses does speak to the rock, but he also strikes it in anger. And God tells Moses, because of this action, I'm not going to let you take the Israelites all the way on into the land of Egypt. Was it that bad of a sin? Was it even a sin? 
But I can tell you this, when you're a leader of God's people, there is a high standard that is set for people that are examples to everyone else. And God wants those people to put an example in front of everybody else that is just exactly what it ought to be. And because of this action, Moses is forbidden to go on in to the land of Israel. <clears throat> As they travel, they will com begin complaining and God will send fiery serpents in their midst. And the snakes, as they bite people, they die. Uh, to spare their lives, Moses will make a brazen serpent and he will stand it on a pole. And if you look to the brazen serpent after you've been bitten, you will live. And Jesus is later on going to say in John chapter 3, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. That is going to be a type or a symbol of Jesus Christ being lifted up. And we have the song that says, Look and live, my brother live. Look to Jesus now and live. And that is what it's referring to. That emblem is also used today in the medical profession. And if you'll see an ambulance going down the road, you will see a serpent on a rod. And, uh, you know, there are so many things where Christianity has embedded itself into our society in its emblems and its wording. And that is one of the places where it is. They will travel around and as they begin to march toward the land of Canaan, they come into the land of the Amorites and uh, their, their king Sihon opposes their marching through. But they've got to march through to get to the land, get to the Jordan River to march on into the land of Canaan. They refuse them permission. They gather their armies to fight against them. Likewise, they ask the Bashanites under their king Og to join with them to fight against Israel. And so you've got Og and the Bashanites Sihon and the Amorites come out to battle against Israel. Now, Og, the king of Bashan, is an interesting character because the Bible it gives us the idea that he's a huge man. But the way it does it is it gives us the size of his bed. He has a bed that is nine cubits or 13 and a half feet long and four cubits or six feet wide. And the idea is here we have a man that is something like 13 feet tall and four to six feet wide. A huge man. But Israel kills him. Israel crushes the Bashanites. Israel crushes the Ammonites. And they will possess their land. And that land will become part of of the children of Israel, two and a half tribes say, we've got a lot of cattle. This land is good for cattle. And uh, when they march into the land of Canaan, they'll march into fight with their brothers and sisters, but then return back into this area as their possession. Meanwhile, Moab is watching this whole thing. Moab is deeply concerned about Israel. They're on the borders of Moab. And uh, Moab has watched them defeat the Ammonites and defeat the Bashanites. And, and the king of Moab, whose name is Balak, he decides that the best way perhaps to defeat Israel is if he can curse them. And he knows of a prophet who has the capability of cursing people, apparently, a man by the name of Balaam. Balaam is uh, some prophet in that area, seems to have some knowledge of the true God. And uh, he sends people to Balaam, and he asks Balaam to come and curse Israel. Well, Balaam told the people that came to him, the messengers that came to him, well, I've got to pray about it first. And he prays, and, you know, guess what God says? No. What do you expect God to say? It's the children of God, the people of God. Is he going to let a prophet go curse him? Of course not. So Balaam tells him, no, he can't go. They go back to Balak, the king of Moab, and they say he won't come. 
And here we find the philosophy of the world. Balak says, in other words, every man has his price. We've offered him so much money. We've offered him a certain high position, but it wasn't enough. And so let's offer him more and a higher position and he'll sell out. Let me just say this. God's people don't have their price. We're not for sale. But the philosophy of this world is, is that everybody has their price. If we'll just meet their price, they'll sell out their principles. So they went back to Balaam with a better offering. And Balaam said, well, I'll, I'll go ask God about it again. Now I want to point out something. This is something Balaam should have never prayed about. He said, what do you mean he shouldn't have prayed? He already knew what the answer was. It is never right to ask God permission to do wrong. He went to pray about it again. He already knew what God wanted. God said no. And this time, God said, all right, Balaam, if you want to go, go ahead. But only say what I tell you to say. Did that mean God wanted him to go? No, it didn't mean he wanted him to go. Because God also sent an angel and he told the angel, I want you to kill Balaam on the way. However, God also gave his donkey the ability to speak and to see the angel. And as they traveled along, the donkey suddenly darted to the side, cut around where the angel was with the drawn sword, Balaam got upset. Happened another time. Balaam got more upset. The angel went to a little narrow spot in the trail where you had to pass through. And the angel balked and refused to go. And Balaam started beating his donkey. And his donkey spoke. And began to argue with him. And I will give you a hint here. If your donkey starts talking to you, don't start talking back to your donkey. And then God opened Balaam's eyes and uh, the angel said, you can go ahead, but you better say only what I tell you to say. And so Balaam went out and he blessed Israel three times instead of cursing them. Balak is very upset. But Balaam said, I can't curse them, but I can tell you how you can get them cursed. If you'll send immoral people in among them and cause Israel to commit sin, God will punish them. And so the Moabites working together with the Midianites sent in immoral women, causing them to commit fornication. The judgment of God fell. 24,000 people in Israel died because of that. And then Balaam had said these words, let me die the death of the righteous. But Moab then goes to battle against Israel. Balaam is with Moab. And Balaam dies in the battle and Moab is defeated. And so we leave Israel now they're, they are at the banks of the Jordan River, having defeated Moab, having crushed and conquered the Ammonites, and completely destroyed the Bashanites. And they are ready to march in. But we have jumped over, talking about the Old Testament law, and we will come back to that in our next lecture and talking about the Old Testament law and how it applies to us today.